Let us begin. Footsie's Hand Guide, Chapter 10. All right. So, it takes more than a technically sound game plan to stay ahead of the field and win consistently. No matter how dominant or reliable your tactics may be, they can still be neutralized by an opponent who sees them coming. Therefore, the last missing piece of the strategic puzzle is misdirection, or as some players call it, randomness. So, when you think of somebody that's random, right? A lot of people, they get really frustrated when somebody's random, and a lot of times it's because they just feel like they're entitled to playing a certain way, right? And the thing is, is if the way they play doesn't work, they get really flustered, and they're just, they just start firing off, right? They just like Red Dead Redemption. They're just like just firing off these excuses, anything that just does not give them the responsibility uh, to get better. They just want to blame everything else. So they call things random, all right? But there is some strategy to being random because it makes it so it's hard for your opponent to track your state of mind track your focus they don't know what you're thinking you know of course being random can pose a threat and detriment to what you're trying to accomplish because sometimes trying to be random at the wrong time can end up causing you to lose all right there is a right time for everything and a wrong time for everything so it's just something to keep in mind one thing isn't going to work against everybody all right and there is that one thing that doesn't work on anybody but then it works on that one person so it's trial and error. That's why experience is so important, right? So element 31. A few times per round, do something completely meaningless, yet relatively safe, for no reason other than to distract your opponent. For instance, if your character has a poke which dominates a certain matchup, skilled players will try to make it whiff as they advance to close the gap. Avoid falling into the trap of abusing your best move at every opportunity. Pick out a few key moments and randomly whiff a, a jab instead of pressing the obvious button. You won't believe how often this trick this tricks opponents into walking right into your low, your low fierces. Fier fier okay. All right, so let's see an example of this. Oh, look at Vi with the fresh fade in the back. Okay. Ah, okay, nice. All right, so you see like leading up to this moment, right? I believe Vi is playing Valento. So he's playing Valento, and Valento's crouching fierce is like extremely just obnoxious in this game. I don't know exactly what game this is, but just telling by the hitbox. Oh, it says Alpha 2 at the top. So just telling by this hitbox, it just seems like it's really annoying to deal with, right? So you see how he's just like influencing and controlling the space, and, and it's it's a deterred it's meant to deter Sakura from closing the gap and establishing her game plan, right? So he's just spamming this, like, it, what looks like mindlessly, right? It looks like it's mindless. And then those ran those jabs that are random afterwards just seem like they're useless. They're not hitting me. What are you doing? And somebody that's already flustered, they'll ignore that. And they don't use that as a, a cue into what the opposing player's mindset is at the given moment. So let's say if I'm very zen, right? I'm not angry. I'm, I'm down on life, but that doesn't phase me. I'm still focused like I was at the start of a match. And we get into this point, and I'm running into those fierces. If, the second I see that jab, I'd say, wait a minute. Why did he just jab there? We both know I'm not in jab range, and we both know I'm not pressing a button. I'm trying to move into a range, all right? So if you're hitting me with this fierce, why wouldn't you just keep hitting me with fierce? That jab must tell me something. There's something going on. There's some ulterior motive that's occurring, that's brewing underneath the surface, all right? Let's watch this again. See how he's, he's just controlling and dictating that space? He's building up that frustration. And I'll show you the jab right here. That was a jab. I know it's kind of hard to see it, but... And you see how the Sakura sees the jab and then just tries to walk in. And gets tagged all right so that's like that goes back to the example i was giving a couple weeks ago when i was talking about the mindset in the art of war how supreme excellence lies in never really having to fight your opponent and that's a prime example of that if you look at his health his health was pretty high up there right and mind you this is against choice so it's not like he's playing against a slouch or anything like that he's a really good player obviously he's a legend right and but you can see though that this 
just having having intention behind things makes a world of a difference like because you can take something that's insignificant and you can now apply it in a in a situation that you otherwise wouldn't right so you can in the end game you don't have to really fight because you just implement something that your opponent wasn't aware of you haven't done the entire time and it just makes it a lot easier to close out the match as opposed to let's say street fighter 5 it's really stressful to close a match out right if you can figure out a way so that your opponent can just kind of grant you the victory let's say like you can set up a spacing that they would want to dash or you set up a range where they want to jump and then you anti-air that's how you fight somebody without ever really fighting because you never force them to do it you convince them to do it remember what i was talking about with uploading shout outs to kaizen but you want to upload your opponent you know what i'm saying instead of downloading them you just upload them you give them that false impression of hey i think it's okay for me to do this so i can start my off oh there you go i'm dead all right cool beans all right so let's go to element 32 another way to escape predictable scripts and flow charts is by mixing up your timing by skipping beats rather than pressing different buttons walk into crouching medium kick range but don't press it right away hang around that distance for a second to lure your opponent into a false sense of security then tag him once they get restless the next time you claim that spot they won't expect you to attack right away okay so this is also a lot of this seems to just be like building on the idea of uploading you see what i'm saying so it's like you're doing x things to convince your opponent that this is what you're trying to do but it's really a carpet underneath their feet and you're, you're just gonna yank it out there underneath their feet and then they're like oh shit you know it's charlie brown moment Okay, so we're going to see that here. So low forward. I'm s All right, so let's rewind this. Hmm. Okay, so you can see like that every time they answer, it's a mirror match, especially so like because it's a mirror match, they're both in the same exact range all the time. So that low forward range is crucial for both of them. So it's a matter of how can I convince him to not do his low forward or how can I punish him for using it, all right? So let me see if I can find an exact example. There's like so much going on. Ah, okay, so that was good. All right, so let's pause it right about. So right here is low forward range, all right? So you see how he's he's not doing anything? He's crouching. In a game like Third Strike, where you have to be aware of parries, this is really important to pay attention to body language because you see him crouch twice. See that? So that's most likely to, to put a parry there, all right? But after the second one, he's convinced because usually people operate on the number two. So when they do something twice, then that's when they confirm it. They don't usually confirm it the first time. So you see how he crouches twice. And he says, oh, all right, I didn't get a priority. So let me just back up and continue about my life doing something else. All right. And he walks backwards and now he's out of range. So he's not prepared for the whiff punish at that point because he wasn't looking for a whiff punish. All right. But you see now he's trying to hover back into that range and he attacks it this time. All right. Okay, so all right, so right there when he gets the dash up low forward, he's not expecting him to attack him immediately. That's probably why he gets hit right there, and he's not prepared for the parry, because parry, of course, is a very important uh, found like a function of footsies in this game because of the risk reward are around it. So he basically builds up the moment of the dash up low forward by being in that range prior instance and he does the crouch and doesn't commit to anything all right so when he's not when he doesn't get the the parry against the the white ken's uh potential crouching medium kick and he backs off he's like okay so since you didn't give me anything that means i can actually get something from this instead so he, that's why he does the dash up so we'll watch this again all right crouch crouch nothing okay and then the next time he enters that range that's why he goes and commits to the low forward right away see and although he doesn't kill him it's still important because look at what this sets up this sets up a chip kill situation 
now Ken is forced to parry, and now that increases his risk. You see, so you can you can turn these like minute little um, details of a match, and you can snowball it into into a situation that you can leverage and you can close a match out on. Because now he doesn't really have to do anything crazy. Like l look at this, you know what I'm saying? What's up, Genesis? Thank you for tuning in. So he he only has to hit him with the fireball chip to kill him. But you see how that one decision of just hitting him with that low forward. Look at his health. You know, so now this changes the entire dynam dynamic of the end game. All right, so that's just something to keep in mind and be aware of. All right, so let's see. Okay, so element 33. Every now and then, especially when an opponent presumes you'll become ultra defensive, simply throw caution on the uh, look, simply throw caution to the wind and go on an offensive tear. I'm gonna upload that right now. Okay, in addition to some seriously nasty mix ups. You'll need the element of surprise to pull this off, which means grasping a good sense of match flow before you flip the, the switch. So, like, the rhythm is very important in terms of, like, being able to deflect your opponent's attention towards something else that's not real. Uh, being deceptive requires you being able to break your own rhythm. All right, that's, like, what Bruce Lee stressed in one of his movies. I forgot which one it was. I don't think it was Way of the Fist, but um, he spoke about, like, being able to break your rhythm, right? That's, like, really important and crucial in a combat because... If you become predictable, it doesn't matter how fast you are. It doesn't matter how strong you are because all the person has to do is intercept, all right? But because you're capable of creating this deception, it makes it a lot easier for you to establish your dominance, to close out a match, to play at a strength, to play away from your weakness, you know? And that that's very important because that goes back into what we talked about with Supreme Excellence, Oh, so it was game of death. Okay, so it was game of death. But it's important for you to, if you're going to grasp that, if you really want to play and win in a way where it's very, you know, easy, then you're going to have to really learn about yourself as much as you do about your opponent. And that's something not a lot of people know about or know how to do, but it's very crucial for you to be able to do that and to learn how to do that. Okay, so let's see. All right, so Balrog, all, wait, this doesn't make any sense. Balrog has literally chip, but he became super aggressive. Let's watch, let's watch this round. This is ST, so this is pretty fast. Okay. Especially because he's a charge character. So, I mean, he, he played like relatively offensive the whole round from what i've seen but because he's a charge character i guess the the context of this element is that by design he's supposed to be defensive right he's supposed to sit there and down back charge okay but obviously chun Li's superior in footsie so that's not something he wants to do but i can definitely see how because of the design of the character and then we look at the the meter like the metrics of the match we see that he has like a chip situation right so he doesn't really want to block anything but he all of a sudden goes on the offensive and maybe the chumley wasn't expecting that and that's what leads up to all of this right because now the the chumley's playing like really like fight or flight she's trying to just get away all right So element 35 just do lots of weird confusing things when the tide of battle has turned against you and nothing seems to be going your way try repeatedly stomping the ground at mid-range if it breaks your opponent's rhythm and makes them question themselves even for a split second it could buy you the opening you need okay let's check this out stomping the ground what what the hell could this be Oh wow. Damn. That's that's rough. That's so funny. Shit. God. So so this entire obviously he's like I'm not really going to get anything out of this, right? But this is just to make him go like, "Yo, what the hell are you doing?" Like it doesn't matter how smart the player is, if you can just get them to just switch their focus for 
fractions of a second, it can be enough for you to do this because then they go from anticipating to now their mind is on something else. And then when they're forced into a situation that they were not anticipating, now it's like confusion occurs. Now it's outside of their logic because their mind isn't, it wasn't prepared for that, right? So hence why he does the dash up and he just does a super. That's crazy. So like, you see how he gets hit and he comes back, right? And he does it once because he wants the gal to think, hey, you're doing this once. I know for a fact you're going to do this again because you just did it like five times in my face. And he immediately goes into the roll instead. And he just does that. That was pretty cool. All right. So it's virtually impossible to hide all of your patterns from observant players. No matter how clever and unpredictable you think you are, someone out there will succeed in identifying and exploiting your habits. You must find ways to mask your thoughts in order to protect your most potent trick, uh, tactics rather, from being turned against you. Whatever strategy you adopt in any given matchup, mix it up with a little freestyle creativity to throw your opponent off the trail. Resist the urge to coast on autopilot. Force yourself to try something new every round. It doesn't need to be unsafe. It doesn't need to be complicated, but it does have to be unexpected. What is this? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm so confused. What the hell is this? <laughs> it's just like a nice little Easter egg. That's mad funny. <laughs> wow, what a scumbag. You got him in an infinite? Oh, God. Look at this car assist, bro. The zero frame startup. That's so cheap. But yeah, all right. So let's go on to... So that's the last chapter, and now we go on to the supplements. So I think like this, with this stuff, it's like a lot of the things that they couldn't really tackle in just one element or a series of elements, so they made an entire dedicated thing to it. All right, so the handbook, Supplement A. Make no mistake about it, mid-range projectiles are absolutely a major facet of footsies. In fact, their uses are so diverse and their impact so significant that it's impossible to cover everything in one article. I'll attempt to provide a conceptual introduction instead. Tactically speaking, a fireball is, rel is a relatively slow poke with good range. Ideally, you want to rely on attacks with roughly four to five frames of startup, which recover quickly. By contrast, projectile specials typically have over 10 frames of startup, followed by lengthy recovery periods, which is still pretty true to this day. To compensate, projectiles possess one exceptional property. Their active hitbox is invincible. With physical attacks, effective range and vulnerable range are approximately equal. Even if you have a full screen normal like Dalsum Stand Heavy Punch, whiffing it in front of Dan still gives him an opportunity to retaliate. Furthermore, Dan's invincible Koryukin will counter Dalsum Stand Heavy Punch from any spot inside its range. These basic principles form the foundation of footsies. The rules of engagement change when dealing with fireballs. Counteracting the opponent's attack is no longer enough to hurt them because projectiles are independent entities. Thus, your table of counters shifts dramatically. Most importantly, you lose the option to retaliate after standing back, because projectiles will continue advancing until they make contact, at which point you'll be pushed out of range. In fact, the longer a projectile move, uh, travels before connecting, the more frame advantage it creates for its owner. And that is very true. All right. Projectiles can be utilized as pokes just as easily as normals can. Projectiles can apply pressure, beat out mistimed normal attacks, repel aggressive opponents, and punish mistakes. There's no unwritten law restricting pokes to normal moves. Some fireballs even knock down, which makes them viable as mid-screen counter pokes. Even if they carry frame advantage, disadvantage when blocked, most opponents are rendered incapable of retaliation after getting pushed so far backward. Two direct universal methods of dealing with projectiles are jumping over them and stuffing them during startup. Jumping is always risky, but the reward is high provided you land a damaging combo. Using a quick poke to prevent the fireball from coming out involves less commitment. However, it does require you to stay within close proximity, which is a challenge against fireball characters. It's always wise to build meter as you work to close the gap, because even the threat of a super move can be enough to discourage opponents from throwing fireballs, tipping the matchup advantage in your favor. 
The entire strategic landscape of Street Fighter changes dramatically once you begin thinking of projectiles as uh, components excuse me, of footsies. Fireballs are what transform Shotos from mediocre poking characters into mid-range powerhouses. The difference between a beginner and an expert player is immediately apparent from how well they apply fireballs and footsies. Okay, so there are a couple of links and I'm going to click on them. So projectiles can be used, utilized as pokes just as easily as normals can. So let's see an example of this. All right. Nice. So, okay. So we'll pause that really quick. That was really fast. But if you see the startup frames, you'll see after he moves in, after the roll, right? He does jab fireball. Wow. Okay. He does stand heavy kick. And then he does a fireball. And it catches Dalsum on startup frames. See that? He's trying to do stand medium kick, I believe. And it hits him. So, but you see immediately how the Dalsum was prepared and does the slide. So, you, of course, whenever you make a mistake, just a side note, be prepared to punish immediately. When you make the mistake, accept the mistake. Don't get frustrated because then you miss out on the solution. All right. It's, you, you don't want to be irritated because you're going to make mistakes. Unless you're perfecting somebody every single round, which is not going to happen ever. Impossible. All right. You're not going to do that for an entire tournament. Not happening. Unless you're doing that then you, you, you should just accept the mistakes. They're going to happen. You know, you have to be willing to make the mistake because some mistakes are good mistakes. You get information out of it. You might get positioning out of it, you know? Uh, you might get meter out of it. Sometimes it's good to get hit on purpose because you want to get bar, like... But it's okay. You just have to give a new meaning to your mistakes. That's where a lot of people mess up in life also because the meaning they give to their mistakes, you know? Like, I am susceptible to this sometimes. Not anymore so much because I've grown a lot, but, like... I used to give like these bad meanings to my mistakes. I'd be like, damn, I'm making a mistake here. This means I'm a bad player. And I just diminish my value as a player because of that. And that's not, that's not healthy. You should not be looking at it like that. That was me being entitled. And it makes no sense for me to be like that. You know what I'm saying? I got to be realistic. So it's just something to keep in mind. All right. So let me know what you guys think so far. Let me see. What questions can I answer from the chat? Who's the best character for somebody just picking up Street Fighter V? Guessing Cammy? Uh, no, actually, I don't think Cammy's the best character to pick up because you might win at like the lower levels, but against the top players, they have the they have the foundations to beat that character. Cammy's top tier, but she's a honest top tier. She's a straightforward top tier. It's not like an Elena top tier where it's like if I know you're doing something, I'm still having a hard time to punish it. Like you can outspace Cammy, you can punish her hard. You know, you can you can uh, you can punish her for having an obvious rhythm. It's not like a Monat where it's very difficult to you know punish her and stuff like that. So it, it takes a lot of skill to play Cammy in certain areas of the game versus top tier players. But like if you want to start off, I guess you want to just run through like the lower level players, then yeah, by all means play Cammy. But I would recommend playing like playing uh akuma i would recommend guile guile is really good because guile gives you the offensive and the defensive aspects of the game down and then you can just graduate to like somebody more advanced in one of the two like then you can go to uh uh you can go to dot you can go from what monat yeah you can go to monat for defense you know playing really like defensive you can learn her for that um you can go to abuki for offense like cami for offense but I would definitely pick like one of the Shoto characters or Guile. I think Guile would be really good for that. All right, so let's see. After reading over 10 chapters on footsies, by now you should have a fairly good idea of what the playing field looks like, where you stand on it and where to go from here. Well, what if you realize you suck at footsies? Worse yet, what if none of this seems appealing to you? My advice would be to keep at it. Developing solid fundamentals requires practice, effort, and time. Don't bother chasing after shortcuts. You'll only end up with more holes. Fact. That said, you don't necessarily have to play footsies if you don't want to. There are other valid approaches to fighting game success. Of course, it's not as simple as ignoring the matter because if your opponent knows how to play footsies properly, they'll draw you into it whether you realize it or not. You're bound to get demolished whenever you let that happen. 
Therefore, you must find ways to actively avoid, escape, or otherwise negate your opponent's ability to hurt you through the offensive methods we've reviewed thus far. It's extremely difficult to manage against seasoned veterans, but then again, it's probably more sensible than trying to beat them at footsies. The universal solution can be split into two main categories, extreme defense and extreme offense. Both styles are geared towards staying out of mid-range, where skillful footsies are most effective. Additionally, there are countless matchup specific means of bypassing footsies for various periods to various degrees, but they're too narrow in scope to discuss here. Okay, so let's see. Extreme defense involves a lot of blocking, walking backward, and outright running away from the first sign of trouble at every safe opportunity. So let's see this walking backward example. Walking backwards. Hmm. Nice. That was really good. So the entire time his body language was like he was moving backwards. All right, so like right there, that Ryu throwing that fireball, it wasn't wise, not only because of the meter. Anytime you're doing something like that, you, you want to pay attention to bars because if you don't pay attention to bar, you might as well subtract it from your health bar. That was like footsie element, like number four or something like that. But you want to be aware of these type of things. And of course, combining that with what you're learning about their body language. How are they moving? Because... How somebody moves naturally is going to tell you what their intentions are when all of a sudden things start to get really intense. You know, it's like, it's kind of like that guy, you know, your friend that like, before you guys go out to the club, he's like, yeah, tonight I'm going to go talk to a lot of girls. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be the social butterfly. Bada bing, bada boom. Oh yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to dance. Mm -mm. And as soon as you get to the club, he's a wallflower. You know, it's just like, okay, well, this is completely contradictory from how you were behaving late, uh, before this. So which behavior is more likely to be real? You know what I'm saying? So if you're seeing this ball, ball rock player just constantly moving back, like, and I don't know what the Ryu's intention, or Alex Vai, okay, I don't know what his intention was to throw that fireball there, but especially when he's moving back like that and you see that he's moving back and jumping forward, why would you throw the fireball, you know? When you combine all of the information that we just got, right? Of course, it's different when you're in a match, so I take that into account, but I'm just saying this in hindsight as we watch it. This is how you get better, is you watch your matches and you discuss these things, all right? Because then when it happens next time, you're more alert and keen to it happening as it's happening. Because there's no use of you studying this if you're not aware of it while it's happening. All right, and that's why I say don't get fixated on trying to win when you're training because then you're gonna miss the opportunities to have that growth. All right. Okay, so let's see. This stratagem dumbs down the game enough to level the playing field, thereby reducing the overall effectiveness of ground fundamentals. Simply put, you're trying to avoid footies by operating well outside that hazardous mid-range zone. Okay, so you see how that ball rock—he wasn't really in footies range; he was kind of like fighting outside of it at that zone three. You know and further that's where he was fighting okay so extreme offense entails constant reckless attacking dashing in crossing up and maintaining overall consistent pressure as above the goal is to rattle someone enough to lure them into equal or greater recklessness abandoning their game plan in the process obviously this manner of all or nothing gambling is highly inconsistent but on a good day it can lead to lucky wins against even the best players in other words, you're trying to negate footsies by crossing over the mid-range boundary and relentlessly sustaining close combat. So this is funny because if you think about Street Fighter V, this is why offense is so good because of the the fact that neutral, like footsies is already significantly weaker because of the hurt boxes, the hit boxes, and the engine with the delay and all these variables and stuff like that. And then of course the damage. So you see how instead of it being level, all of a sudden it starts to tilt like risk reward offense is all the way up here and now neutral is just towards the the bottom of the reward scale all right you want you want to obviously take advantage of the strength which is up here because it's tilting and off the offense's favor that's why the game's so offensive because if you look at the design of the game it tells you this is how you should be playing it all right so let's see um all right so what was this Oh, this is the all-or-nothing game. Okay. Um. Oh, this is... Oh, I remember this. I don't know if you guys seen this before. All 
All right, so command grab that's technically risky, right? Command grab <laughs> again <laughs> Look at him he'll rub his head. He's like Ugh, this this character's cheap. Oh my goodness. You know what time it is. Yep Yep Oh my god, nobody nope Kokujin ain't blocking that. I'm not blocking that. <laughs> he didn't even play. <laughs> wow, Makoto was so dope. Shout outs to Makoto season four, hopefully. Her and Fei Long, please. Please. Alright, cool. So where were we? Um Cool. So stage position is important as well. It's critical to keep out of corners at all times when fighting corner special uh, pressure specialists like Guile and Sentinel. Against some characters such as Yurian and Goken, it's better to stay mid-screen in general because their damage potential is far more reasonable away from those combo empowering walls. Sometimes it's simply wiser to run away and build meter when it would tilt the matchup scales heavily in your favor. For example, ST Dalsum has direct reactionary counters to everything Ryu can do, but gaining access to uh, but gaining access to his Shinku Hadouken gives super gives Ryu instant comeback potential. It's also smarter to run away from an opponent who already has meter, rather than face the possibility of single combo death when you need to land three combos to win. Okay. As you can see, there are quite a few situations where it's easier to avoid playing footsies. Never underestimate the power of blocking, because it's much safer than trying to be a hero all the time. Calmly do whatever it takes to win tournaments. However, in training, I wouldn't pass up the opportunity to practice footsies against better players, because you'll probably learn more from an intense loss than a mindless win. That's also true. So the, the idea of sacrificing victories is something that I think a lot of players especially in the u.s a lot of u.s players talk about like the reasons why japan's ahead of us it's not only that they are willing to learn and together but they're willing to learn independently so what i mean by that is that if you look at players top players a lot of times they will sandbag in certain situations not so much in street fighter 5 because damage just seems so important right because people just kind of want to end the match as quickly as possible but it does exist though, but it's not as like prevalent as in the older games where some players would sacrifice damage for information where they won't go for the maximum punish and they'll drop a combo on purpose just to see if you mash during a string. Because they'll remember that. If they see that you're trying to mash during a, a jump in like stun combo, then they're like, oh, okay. So you're one of those players that might mash when I anti-air you and dash up after the anti-air. You know what I'm saying? And go, if I go for the 50-50, you might just mash because you don't want to guess the 50-50. So like they'll make these ideas and they'll tie it to other instances or behaviors previously in the match. So if something hasn't happened yet, they kind of have an inclination to what could possibly happen based off of what's happened before. It's not 100% right, obviously, but that's the point, is to try to tip the scales as much as possible in favor of your read, in favor of your analysis, and in favor of you performing that action that could potentially secure the round for you. So that's really important um so yeah it's just something to keep in mind all right so let's see um yeah so that's why they're saying like you know don't pass up the opportunity to learn so instead of me beating let's say if i know i can beat nl in, in um footsies or something right instead of me beating him in footsies why not beat him in another way that i could try to you know strengthen my offense or something you know like let me try to beat him by by scrambles. Let me try to beat him through resets or, you know, by like try to beat him in up close proximity with throws and stuff like that. Or let me let me try to beat him by playing runaway, like just trying different things like that. So you can strengthen your play of it or at the very least your interpretation of it. Because when it's happening, it's not as scary because it's not as foreign to you. You know what I'm saying? Like there will be certain elements like, you know, as you guys are learning this, these footsies elements, it's not as scary to you anymore because you're like you're aware of it because you're aware of it you can manage it now you know instead of you fighting in the dark and you're just swinging with your eyes closed now you have something that you can aim at something tangible all right that's why learning is important because now you can be more accurate in terms of what you're trying to do okay all right guys you guys follow me so far let me know let me know how it's going let's see so Yurian. Okay, so this is a very common thing in third strike, and some players do this in five, uh, especially season one. So Mika season one, right? 
we all know how ridiculous she was. There were certain Miko players. They even do it now, though. A lot of some of them do do it now, depending on the player. They might do an entire match. They might just start the match walking all the way back to the corner. All right. Um, but some of them might just they might just move back after a certain instance. But the point stands. Some players literally corner themselves, and that seems counterintuitive or counterproductive to what they're trying to accomplish, but actually plays into what they're trying to accomplish because all it takes is one back throw or one clap, Mika clap into back throw, all right? So you're going to see this. You see how the Urian player is just backing up like randomly? Like, why is he doing this? You know? Look at that. He's still backing up. This is like the more, more uh, suspect one. Because he's he already knows he can't move that far back, right? Let's say he was trying to move to create distance. Then yeah, I could understand this, right? So maybe, uh, all right, I can believe it. I can believe it. When I stop believing it, it's right when his back's towards the corner. Because he knows, especially if he's a smart player, he already knows that at this range, that he can't really go back any further. So him jumping back is telling me something. He's trying to convince me to move closer to him. So that way he can just put me back in the corner somehow, all right? See, he's trying to throw there. Why was he trying to throw? Because that's where Yurian is going to optimize his damage. Uh-oh. See, look at that. It immediately goes for offense. So, body language, guys. I stress it. I stress it. You see, like... These little things, like, you don't have to win every battle, but win the right ones. And the way you figure out which ones to win, you just pay attention. You see how nothing's going on here? If Justin wasn't so asphyxiated on trying to, I don't know, get damage, get build bar, whatever his intentions were, if he could just, like, be like, wait a minute, stop sign. Put a mental stop sign in your head. What's going on? And you just take a mental picture. Like, okay, he's moving back. Why is he moving backwards? This is... That that why is is that's a powerful question to ask yourself because if you say if you ask yourself why you don't know right if you don't know then you want to know you want to figure it out and you take the time to figure it out so that's why you ask questions when you make blatant statements in your head then you're not really playing you're not dancing with your opponent you're not being empathetic and putting yourself in their shoes and trying to figure out what they're trying to do all right in a game like Street Fighter Five it's so crucial to be aware of what your opponent's trying to do because if you can't react to everything. It's not realistic. And it wasn't realistic in the other games even, you know? But, of course, it was a lot easier to, to do it because you can react, you can fall back to certain ranges, and just you can just systematically react to X, Y, Z in order of fastest to slowest. That's how I used to play it, right? But it's not as... You can't really get away with it like that in this game, okay? So that's why you see a lot of people will dash up in a great player's face because the other player was looking for a jump in. They were so focused on a jump in and so focused on this, so focused on that, all right? So that's what happens when you try to download instead of uploading. Okay, so let's see. Um, and now this is the epilogue. Okay, so what should you do? What should you do when a veteran player is outguessing you at every turn? It's happened to everyone where every last thing you do gets hit. Your every medium range poke gets swept, your every long range move gets stuffed, and doing nothing opens you up to pressure. The answer is obvious block. Sometimes when, when they've got your number, just block. They're totally playing by your rhythm. So don't make any moves for a second until they don't know how to read you anymore. When you block, don't do it out of fear. Do it to wait them out. Do it to take away their momentum. Do it to figure out their methods. Do it to plan your next move. The key here is that there are only two ways to beat someone who's good at footsies. Outthink them and do everything they're doing, except better, or, number two, work out some alternative strategies to avoid that dangerous zone entirely. Okay? Very, be mindful of that. You don't always have to beat somebody at their game. But you don't always have to create an alternative strategy either. You don't always have to run away from the strategy. You can do both. Alright? Otherwise, you have no chance of winning. Playing footsies to survive is simply delaying an inev inevitable loss. Skilled opponents can sense indecisive reluctance and press the advantage. Give 100% effort to footsies or don't play footsies at all. The easiest person to play footsies against is that intermediate player who hasn't quite given up on footsies, but doesn't play footsies to win. He doesn't move around much, he doesn't keep track of long-term patterns, and he plays almost exclusively on a reactionary level. He's not trying to get you to do anything specific, he's simply reacting to where you're standing. He doesn't think his footsies are good enough to help him win whole matches, he's being lazy. 
playing footsies with that casual mindset is the mental equivalent of being backed into a permanent corner. If you're hesitant and uncertain, then your wins will come from luck and your losses will be inexorably fitting. Do not, under any circumstances, allow your opponent to get inside your head and dictate your game plan. If your best poke gets beaten by a fluke counter, get over it. Don't let it startle you. Sure, losing 10% life sucks, but you'll survive it. What you won't survive is allowing one exchange to convince you to stop using your best button for the rest of the round. Giving up on moves only does one thing. It reduces your options. If you get swept, that means you are outsmarted. It doesn't necessarily mean your opponent is smarter than you. and It doesn't have to mean that you'll get outsmarted again. Remember, sweep is 10% damage. You will get back up. Rule number five, forget about winning or losing. Go all out or don't even bother. And that is that, guys. So we can continue talking about a couple of things. Now, when it mentions that you don't want to let things startle you and you don't want to give up, it doesn't, like, I'm pretty sure the author here was talking about in, like, a literal sense in terms of tool set, but there's also the mindset. A lot of people will give up on their strategy entirely and they will give in to their ego. Like, that's what I am guilty of, is that, let's say me, for example, sometimes I will get so annoyed by something that I go out of my way to beat it, you know? And that is how you lose because now you completely just disregarded what was working for you or what you've been planning and strategizing or all of this muscle memory you've been building up for this one tournament or exhibition this set, you know, this practice session with this player that you're trying to improve with. You just throw that out of the window when you start to have these ulterior motives that are exist outside of growth, you know, or exist outside of a, um, achieving a specific goal. So it's very important. Self-awareness is crucial for you to make all of this work, all right? You can't make all of these components come together and work if you're not aware of yourself, okay? And being aware doesn't mean, hey, I need to stop doing this immediately right now. Like, no. Being aware is just knowing the fact, all right? Because you can't change something until you know there's something to change. Remember that, all right, guys? You can't change something unless you know there's something to change. I stress that, all right? You don't want to be in the dark. Otherwise, you'll get really frustrated, you get flustered, you know, and, and it's just going to be very annoying, okay? Is the Laura versus Zaf's matchups? No, it's definitely not 10 all. I'm telling you, watch when I play Item again. I'm 100% certain I'm going to do 10 times better than I did, all right? If I don't beat him, I know I'm going to do way better than I did that, that match, that sale, whatever, okay? I want you guys to see that. Hopefully, I go to New York next week. Got to book my ticket on Friday, but... Okay, so... um. So let me go back. There was one thing I did want to see with the fireball example. So I was right here. So let's see. Oh, okay. All right. So I knew I was missing some stuff. What is it? All right. And this is okay we already seen this example all right so let's refresh on this right what's up chris thank you for tuning in what's going on earl thanks brother i've been getting body so bad in this game it's okay man you gotta keep at it you're learning new stuff you're not gonna be a sage and a god your first month of practicing something new all right unless you're putting in the volume of training then of course then i can see where that frustration comes from but all right, so projectiles can be utilized as pokes just as easily as normals can. So we saw the example with the Dalsum and the Ryu, right? Or the Guile, rather, when he was doing the fireball on his poke, on his counter poke stand medium kick. So fireballs can apply pressure, beat out mistimed normal attacks, repel aggressive opponents, and punish mistakes. There's no unwritten law restricting pokes to normal moves. Some fireballs even knock down, which make them viable as mid-screen counter pokes, even if they carry dis frame a disadvantage when blocked. Most opponents are rendered incapable of retaliation after getting pushed so far backward. Okay, so let's look at this example. So the mid-screen counter poke option. I believe it's this one, right? Let's see. Oh no, it's this one. Okay. Oh, nice, okay. So we see right there after the block sweep at max range, right? He knows that the, the Ken player is going to probably want to retaliate with something and he does a fireball. 
usually good players we talked about it when a good player is out of range what do they do they walk up right and mind you this is john Choi and alex Faye. so john Choi, being a great player knows hey i'm not in range of my low forward right and we talked about many streams ago we talked about a lot never cross never block right because your opponent when you when you crouch and you block you're fatter and when you're fatter it's easier to hit you when it's easier to hit you it's easier to chip you it's easier to build meter it's easier to push you away to a superior positioning okay so you see he blocks that and then he does oh i'm gonna walk up and low forward right but instead the ryu player alex Vai, after the sweep commits to fireball see So that was a good example. And let's, what's this one? This one is the discouraging one. Yep, okay, so it's wise to build meter as you work to close the gap because even the third of a super move can be enough to discourage opponents from throwing fireballs. Okay. So we see Balrog as super. Ah, okay, nice. So you see how Balrog struggles in the Sagat matchup because he has a hard time getting in and closing the gap, of course, right? So because we know that, we know that he's going to want to counter fireballs, obviously. And one of the main ways he's going to do it is with this bad boy right here, Super Bar. So I'm pretty sure Choi is Sagat because he's a fireball player, right? So Choi does, uh, you see, you'll see him do, I think, a, a whiff short. Let's see, where is it? Let's see. Mm -hmm. See that? Okay, so so now that short right there that you guys saw, which was in the other element we talked about earlier in the stream, was to create that, you know, fake rhythm and see if he would walk into the next fireball, right? So you guys will see it. See that? And it worked, right? You see that? So we're seeing multiple elements from previous elements that we just learned. We're seeing it in completely different examples for other things. All right? So you see that he does the, the short and he walks back and he does fireball. And look what happens. Boom. Hits him on his dash punch. But now look what happens, all right? Because he knows that John Choi knows that, hey, I have bar. And he knows that he, that John Choi knows that he wants to use that super bar because look at the life differential. But look at how it's now opened up the space because the one thing that hurts Balrog is the fireballs, but there's nothing to worry about because John Choi is playing, I guess you could say, too smart. So smart, in fact, that it's made him predictable, right? And you see how the Balrog player, how um, Watson whiffs the jab after that, after he gets hit? Look at this. See how he whiffs the jab? And there's kind of like a delayed crouch. So he's confirming. He's like, oh, you're not doing anything. Walk up. Sweet. Look at that. That was really good. Because all of that, all of this, all this health bar... That just diminished in, in a matter of seconds. It's increasing pressure in, in John Choi's mind to do something. Like great players, if you make them make mistakes over the course of a match, they don't really crack. But if you make them make many mistakes back to back to back to back to back like this, that's when they usually crack. All right? So you guys can see that. So you see, it's like one mistake after another. All right. It's two mistakes three mistakes all right and then he's just ready for the whiff punish so yeah so that is that guys that is it for the footsies handbook we've we've done it we've, we've gone through all of it what else do you guys want me to do
I'm so glad that we got to to do this tackle this together because I haven't read it in a long time and I feel like that sharpened me so much in a lot of things like a lot of areas because a lot of areas I was just so natural at it I've practiced it so much but then it really reminded me of certain things I was like wait a minute wow I haven't tackled this or approached this or tried this in a, like ages so it's just making me so much better but um yeah so let me know what you guys think how do you guys feel uh let me let me know how you guys are gonna go about tackling you know this, these homework assignments i want you guys to play 100 matches all right this i'm gonna give you guys homework right now 100 matches okay from now until from now until when is when is gonna be my next stream my next sub stream let me see let me check this out let me see let me see let me see saturday saturday let's do saturday this saturday all right at noon all right we're gonna do it at noon so 12 o'clock i want you guys to have 100 matches and i want you guys to pick three elements any three elements it doesn't matter just pick three of them pick three of them all right and then you do 100 matches just practice it could be online offline i don't care you can watch 100 matches just get 100 matches in volume every day don't try to squeeze it into one session all right guys because that is a mistake you do not need to have an intense training that's like a myth all right spread it across like jelly on bread that way the sandwich tastes better right spread it across and over the course of what five days from now until saturday that's 20 matches a day that's nothing i know you guys can definitely bang that out i want you guys to pick three elements all right and then just somewhere on a, on a piece of paper write down the elements that you're gonna do and keep them right next to you you can put them on a sticky note i have sticky notes i have them right here at all times i have a pen bada bing bada boom just have it there ready write them down uh, 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 uh. right you put a big smiley face just for you guys and you just keep it right there next to you at all times it's accessible so every match every single match every round actually even better every round you look at it and say i'm supposed to be doing this because what's going to happen is your brain is going to fall back onto your muscle memory it's going to keep resorting and going back to what you know okay so you have to handicap yourself in those areas you have to eliminate the way you usually win and lose in a new way all right so that's what i want you guys to do all right so please do that and let me know how it goes what's up ronan what is your question that's cool aj it's gonna be uploaded bro you can catch it right after you can hit me up and we can talk about it oh dtn is this weekend oh jip bro i'm not gonna be able to go because saturday night is uh we're gonna have like a dinner for my for my sister even though her wedding was last week we're gonna do it again we're gonna have like another wedding but this time with like the cousins and stuff because the dinner last Week was private so we're gonna have like a fancy schmancy party on a boat i guess or some cruise or something i don't know but yeah but uh saturday so i guess saturday will be a great day saturday i'm gonna do that i'm gonna do my sub saturday this saturday i'm gonna try it see how it works i don't think i can guarantee every saturday but i'm gonna alternate the days so this saturday we'll do that guys this upcoming saturday at 12 o'clock We'll have our subs added. I'm going to pick three of you guys. Three subs. Three random subs. I have 13 subs right now, okay? One of you 13 subs. Three of you. One, three of you, I'm going to randomly choose. And we're going to do one of three things, all right? We're A, we're going to do a first of five. B, we're going to review some match footage of your choice. Or C, we're going to learn a matchup that you want to learn together, all right? We're gonna do that together we're gonna go about studying the hell out of it like how i study my characters all right we're gonna do that together all right so let's do that we're gonna do that saturday all right so for my subs we're gonna do that i mean you guys can feel free to sub right now you guys can potentially get in on it but what's gonna happen is every week i'm gonna rotate so if i don't get you three this week i'll get you three next week if i don't get you that week i'm gonna get you the week after maybe some weeks i can squeeze in two uh sub sessions you know what i'm saying but it all depends on like how many subs i end up getting and stuff like that because you know it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of people at some point all right but yeah so let's see let's say you are practicing an element and your opponent is obviously not falling for it how would you suggest to approach that situation then do the other thing because tie tie together two elements 
you'll have an element for when they're doing something and when they're not falling for it okay so when you do a let's say i walk into sweep range and they're not pressing anything then i just walk into sweep range but don't press anything walk up and just throw you know just come up with different things walk up and fireball you create the elements after that the elements are like let me correct myself so the element is a foundation and the branch the decision tree is what makes you you all right so some players when they walk up and they whiff that you know they whiff that crouching let's say i go into range right some players when they do this when they walk into that low forward range they'll do that if their opponent isn't doing something some players will throw fireball some people will jump you know, some people will walk up more and jump, you know, and, and stuff like that. Genesis, thank you for the sub. I appreciate it, brother. You are very much appreciated. Thank you for joining the bloodline. Shout out to my JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. I can't wait till part five. Oh my God, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. I cannot wait. But so you have variety. This is where you introduce your own like personality into how you interpret footsies. That's the beauty of footsies, guys. Like. Just because we talked about element one being walk up into a range and with a jab, you know, and then with punishing, doesn't mean you always have to do that. You can walk into a range with a jab and jump. You can walk into a range with, with a jab and dash. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's so much beauty to all of this. Like, you have so many variations, and I'm so glad you asked that, Ronan. That's why you're so godlike, because you asked these godlike questions, because I wouldn't have thought to say that, you know? And that's why I appreciate you guys so much. For coming on here and asking questions because it makes the stream experience 10 times better all right so i appreciate you guys so much bro i just want to get better yo genesis i promise you if you stick around bro we'll all get better you know what i'm saying because if you ask questions it forces me to think you know what i'm saying and that's what that's just what it is so anytime you feel free you have so many people in here that are willing to help you out we're all brothers in here brothers and sisters you know like everybody's willing to help out everybody you know, and that's that's what it is. We're a family in here. You have AJ, AJ, me and him trained for years, and you know, he knows a lot of the stuff that I teach too. You know? So like you can ask him if, if I don't get around to answering it or something like that. Abedino, thank you for following. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, let me give some shout outs to some of the people that followed because I wasn't looking at my OBS. I'm sorry. And yeah, third screen for that. But um let me see. Oh guys, I'm so hyped because I got um premiere pro so hype so now i'm gonna be just cranking out videos once i get a hang of it Pfft, watch I'm telling you guys okay so let's see genesis thank you for following and subbing today i appreciate that alex remedy 944 thank you for the bits i appreciate it and your sarcastic humor asking me if laura's a 10 match matchup this asshole but yeah i appreciate you guys of course you guys are awesome you guys are phenomenal you guys already know that though hi are you from africa no i well i my family is i'm 100 percent cape verdian so i'm pretty sure you know where that is because you asked me that question but i was born in the u.s but my parents were born in africa so i can speak the language and i can i can you know interpret it whatever um i'm not like 100 percent fluent but i'm like 80 85 percent i would say and yeah so you know i just like to represent that's my country it's my homeland so it is what it is so the element that just lays the foundation, but it is up to me to fail and come up with my own variations of that situation, or at least how to take advantage of that situation. Exactly. You got it, Ronan. Perfect. You've said it perfectly. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. It's up to you to interpret it. You know what I'm saying? I gave you that little variety. You can do it any way you want. You know what I'm saying? You, you I showed you right here. Just walk up, walk up with a button, dash. You know what I'm saying? And then you, you learn how to get better at those variations of it you know what i'm saying like if i do dash, if i do the walk up jab practice the fastest jab, dash possible you see how i did that it looked like look like i didn't even buffer it right because if it looks like i buffer you'll see ryu like this let's see if i do this all right see how he kind of stutters he's like he's like that but then if i want to get better at it make it look like it's an illusion like i was so fast when i did it see and then people get grabbed like that but other players like some players you need to do that you need to delay you need to fake them and throw them like that you know like show them that i'm going to dash you know other let's give you another variation of that let's say i walk up and i do the jab right i walk up and i jab and i just crouch but i don't do anything you see what i'm saying you see how this tree is getting really extensive now i walk up i jab i da i i crouch i don't do anything all right let's do it again i do nothing all right and then let me 
save this state really quick. Okay, so I walk up. I jab. Next time I walk up, I jab. Crouch. I do nothing. Jab, crouch, dash. Right? Or... You know what I'm saying? Or instead of you walking up and doing it, you see how you can come up with different variations? I can jump into it. I can jump into it. Jump, crouch, and light kick. Light, light punch, whatever. Jump, stand, light kick. You can... There's so much variety, it's insane. You can you can jump and with a stand, light kick. You can jump and with a, a, a crouch and light kick. Or the inverse, you can move backwards into a range, right? Like... It's just, there's so many ways to go about it. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Just practice it, bro. So, playing patient is staying outside opponent's uh, forward dash right and waiting for a jump. Not necessarily. Um, playing patient isn't just waiting. It's not just waiting. It can be, you can be active while being patient. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could be doing all of these things, but I'm not really trying to inflict damage. I'm just waiting for something outside of this situation. You don't always have to be sitting there idly and letting your opponent do stuff because if I just sit here all day then that's increasing the likelihood of my opponent taking advantage so you can be patient behind things it's like when you start to when you become aggressive it's when you start to kind of get tunnel vision you know that's when you get aggressive you can still be active and offensive and still be relatively patient because let's say if I knock you down right and then I walk back, that's being patient, but I still threw you, I was still offensive, right? But then if I'm aggressive, if I throw you and I dash, you know, even though I know, like, that's potentially a punish, you know, that's that's when you'd want to be like, okay, something to be uh, mindful of. 